If following lower carb protocols was so effective for performance, then why wouldn't you see more athletes doing it? Why wouldn't you see more endurance athletes doing lower carb protocols? They all still tend to eat relatively higher glycemic diets, right? They, they really load up on glucose, then they go run, then they refuel with glucose. Now, I have to be the first to say that that is not necessarily a bad way of doing things, okay? It's been demonstrated that for endurance work, carbohydrate fueling does work, okay? You just need to continually refuel, right? That's why people will consume like sugary gummies or those goo packs while they're exercising because you just become a glucose burner and you have to be okay with refueling. Now, I'm not suggesting that doing a lower carb, higher fat protocol is automatically going to be better than that, okay? Different strokes for different folks, people do different things and they work different pathways. But for longer endurance work, there is some pretty solid evidence that following a lower carb protocol could be more effective. But I wanna focus more on what could potentially be happening behind the scenes when we load up with a bunch of glucose before going out for a run or when training for a triathlon or when doing a long row or going for a long ride. We'll break it down. It's pretty interesting. It has to do with cardiac tissue and some of it is mechanistic data uh, that we can't completely take to the bank, but it still makes us kind of go, hmm, okay? So today's video is brought to you by Seed. Okay, Seed is a symbiotic, which means it's a really cool technology. This is my go-to probiotic. And you might be thinking like, what the heck does it have to do with glucose? What does it have to do with performance? People do not realize how important the microbiome is when it comes down to glucose tolerance and the ability for our cells to utilize glucose properly fiber, all of this stuff. It's not just the digestive system, okay? What happens is this bacteria that's in our gut breaks down the fiber into these things called short chain fatty acids. And these short chain fatty acids are what are called signaling devices, which can send signals and actually help regulate how we use fuels, okay? There's even bacteria known as veonella that has been demonstrated to be part of like an endurance athlete, someone that does a lot of running or a lot of cycling. They are going to have a higher degree of this kind of bacteria and a downstream effect as a result. Point is, is if you're focused focused on glucose metabolism, you're focused on exercise, then you may want to look at your microbiome. So the symbiotic uses a capsule inside of a capsule, really cool technology. Bottom line is if you use that link down below, you can save 15% off, use code THOMAS15, 15% off of SEED, which is a revolutionary game changer probiotic if you ask me, and it has my stamp of approval on them. So they're down below. So I'm gonna open up with a study that was published in the American Journal of Physiology. Now, full disclaimer, this study was conducted on cardiac muscle tissue from rats. Okay, so you're probably thinking, I'm going to discount this study, I'm not a rat, and I'm a human, that has a lot of different variables. You are correct. That is definitely true. But the way that we look at things is that we start by looking at rodent models. We start by looking at in vitro stuff, and then we confirm it in human studies. So it's a long process, requires a lot of money and a lot of data to do. But anyway, here's where it starts. So what they did with this study is they took this cardiac tissue and they saturated it with glucose. They basically mimic as if that tissue, those cells were going to be in a very high glucose environment, almost like you were hyperglycemic. Okay. Well, what they found is that this ended up affecting calcium levels. It triggered abnormal calcium responses within this tissue. Now, calcium is so critical for the heart. So critical. Okay. It is what allows for the contractile action of the heart. Okay. So what they were demonstrating was that with this, the, the cells were becoming so dysfunctional in terms of the calcium that they were going to have dysfunctional contractile ability. Okay. This is as a result of oxidative stress from the heart. So essentially the heart is beating harder than it should or not beating hard enough. There's a lot of ambiguity when it comes down to the words dysregulation or dysfunctional, right? But the simplest way that we can really explain how this works is if you were to take a rubber band and you were to try to strum it or ping it with your finger, okay? Well, if your finger was calcium, that gives you a good indicator, okay? So you have a nice system that is relayed between how your muscles are moving, how your brain is working, how everything's jiving, and how your cardiac tissue works and how your heart beats, okay? Calcium, I don't want to say it's a rate limiting step because in a way it is, but it's also just very important. So if calcium levels are out of whack, then that means that my finger might start moving that rubber band really fast or pinging it really fast or pinging it really slow. And that's going to 
just affect the function of the contractile tissue. Okay, this can result in oxidative stress because the heart's beating too hard, creating more stress, but it can also just make it so your heart is working too hard or too little and you're not reaching your cardiovascular potential. Now, you're going to still see the same kind of like effect as far as your perceived exertion because your heart is still working hard, but are you potentially stopping yourself from reaching that threshold, right? Reaching where you really wanna be. Now, the question is like, what's happening here mechanistically? This is where it gets confusing because anytime we try to look at mechanistic data, it's a lot of speculation, okay? We don't know everything that's going on in the body, so we have to completely understand this, but I'll tell you what the researchers have looked at. They seem to believe that it has something to do with what is called SERCA or CIRCA. This is a calcium pump that is in the heart that pumps things out, it pumps calcium out. I liken it to that of a fire marshal, and I've referenced this in another video. That fire marshal sees when there's too much calcium, so it tells them to leave, it kicks them out, it's like a bouncer, okay? well. If the fire marshal is not there because circa is disrupted, the calcium pumps aren't working and that's leaving too much calcium in there causing uh, you know, this dysregulated rhythm, right? The contractile function is messed up. This is a problem and glucose seems to, at least in vitro, affect that circa. So that's pretty important stuff. Now, what we have to look at here with this, does this mean that like one time of having a bunch of glucose before a workout is going to affect you? No, okay. I think the way that short-term glucose is going to affect us, like higher spikes, is more mental, okay? Because a calm brain, a relaxed brain is a fast brain, okay? So when we want the brain to kind of jive, we want to be able to get in the zone, we don't want unstable networks, okay? We want what's called network stability. We want the regions of the brain to be able to communicate with one another very well so that all systems are firing appropriately. We don't have weird nervous system responses. Okay, this is super important when it comes down to the grit that it takes to just get through a triathlon or the grit that it takes to get through a long ride or a long run. So if you have a big glucose spike and then insulin subsequently comes up high, that crashes your glucose, that's going to be a problem for you mentally, but also physically too. But mentally, then all of a sudden, like all the systems that were firing like super high strung are now kind of whacked out. We want stability. So I'm not going to stand here and say that like, being on a low carb protocol is superior for X, Y, Z. But I will say when it comes down to glucose stability, I think that is a pretty important piece. Glucose stability is something we should be looking at. Being able to provide the body with a continual source of fuel. Because when you're low carb, glucose isn't going away. You're not getting rid of glucose. You're just having less influence from a dietary standpoint, spiking it and crashing it. So even if your glucose does moderately go up, even on a lower carb protocol, which it can via exercise and different stressors and things like that, it's probably still going to be a good thing that it's relatively stable. Okay, when you start looking anecdotally at people that are lower carb versus people that are higher carb, for endurance work, you could probably see some more stability with the lower carb people. I know for me as an endurance athlete that generally follows a lower carb protocol, my glucose stays pretty mellow until I stop moving. Then it pools and it goes up higher. Now that is a somewhat normal response. I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of ketones as a fuel for working out because I think that's a very, it's nebulous territory. Like we can see that ketones are great for low intensity activity, but so low intensity that it might not apply directly for a, like a triathlete or someone that's going for a run. What you want to focus on is how do we avoid these massive uh, influxes of glucose that could be negatively impairing us. Especially when you start looking at the data, you see that VO2 max or VO2 peak power can be impaired by hyperglycemia. So the bottom line is that fueling your runs and fueling your rides with a bunch of glucose is not necessarily the best thing. It's almost better to have glycogen stores set up, but somewhat be fat adapted. Now, what I mean by that is periodically do your longer runs or do your longer rides, things like that in a relatively deficient state. What I mean by that is lower carb or even fasted. So the body learns how to utilize fat as a substrate for fuel, right? Learns how to do that, but you're not completely abandoning the ability to utilize glucose. It's sort of like when you start looking at the old train low, uh, compete high studies, so the sleep low studies, where they found like training in a deficit, training when it's hard, will yield a better response when it comes time to compete under perfect circumstances. So you do want to kind of stress your body in different ways and don't baby it by continually providing glucose. I think 
personally, you could only be negatively impacting yourself, but you're also making yourself more dependent on consistently needing glucose. Depending how long the adventure is or long the ride is, you know, you may need to add that in, but if it's going up to like 15, 20 miles on a run, you can really do that in a deficit pretty easily if your body's fat adapted. So we do have to pay attention to that. As always, I'll see you tomorrow.